Hey, this is David here from Team Power Haskell Banker, and thank you so much for joining Eric and I today on the PowerCast. It's Tuesday night, it's 5 o'clock, and we're excited to share with you some new and exciting information over here. This past couple of weeks, we've been asking buyers and sellers to reach out to us, send us questions, things you might want to know in buying a house, selling a house, and we actually have a handful of questions that we got in for us, which is very exciting to share with the people and go over. There's, there's some good questions in there. There are some very good questions. First of all, if you have... on there subscribe watch us live every week you'll be alerted to the show we love talking with you and we're always looking for new topics and people that you may want us to talk about as well please go to our instagram page team powerhouse sells team go to our facebook page again team powerhouse sells and of course tiktok which is the exciting most exciting page with all our videos new listings coming on and things to share with you on the upcoming market and uh, let's go and talk about what the buyers and sellers have been asking questions about this past couple of weeks. All right, let's start with a question for Eric. Cool. Can you tell how many amps uh, an electric of, ele of electricity a house has? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, Ron? Ron from Wolkett. Ron from Wolkett. Thank you, Ron, for that question. Uh, interesting question. So um, there's two ways that you can tell. One of them is from the outside of the house. Um, if you're knowledgeable enough, um, there, uh, the, the line that runs from the pole to the house, it's going to have a certain gauge, a certain thickness to it. And that thickness will tell you if it's a 60 amp, 100 amp, or 200 amp service. Um, if you're not educated enough in looking at that, which I'm not, I can never tell the difference. Right. Um, when you go to the main distribution panel inside the basement, if it's in the basement or in the garage, wherever it might be, depending on the, you know, the characteristics of the house. Uh, but that main distribution panel will have at the top a main breaker and that main breaker normally has the number on it it'll say 60 100 or 200. Uh, more common uh, is 100. 200 is a larger house and definitely something that has electric heat. Um, I haven't seen a 60 amp in a while have you? Actually no I haven't seen 60 amp and as a matter of fact I don't think you know the, the loans today with the VA, the Chaffa and the FHA I'm not sure that a 60 amp is allowed anymore so I think it has to be a minimum 100. And you mentioned about the outside of the house. You're right. It's very difficult for us non-electrician people who are realtors to look at the outside of the house with the cable and the gauge of the amp. That's why you have the inspection done, right? So Yeah, and that's why when I do look up, uh, the only thing I look to make sure is that the, the drip loop is there. You know the drip loop? Yes. Yeah. That's a pretty cool thing to learn about that whole drip loop and why it's there. Actually. The drip loop? Yeah. Yeah, so that's um, uh, that drip loop is there so that water does not run down the power line down into the panel. Okay. So the drip loop, uh, if if and when it does rain, the uh, the wire is set to go up and then to go down and then back up. Water obviously will not travel up. So it'll travel down that line and it'll drip off off that kind of bow at the bottom. Very cool yeah. stuff. And as Eric mentioned, the uh, panels, they definitely are not always in the same location. Typically they're gonna be in the room in the basement where all the mechanicals are, but very common, we might find them behind a picture in a basement area or a wall where it's finished. It can also be in the upstairs area, uh, in a garage area. There's well, lots the of house. Things. Yeah, the house doesn't have a basement. Right. It could be in the garage or it could be in, inside the house itself. Absolutely. Yeah. Good question, very much. That was Ron. Thanks, Ron. Ron, yeah, good question. question Mike in North Haven. What is a mortgage consistency name and what is the importance of this date? Consistency, I can't quite read that. All right, so... Probably mortgage contingency. contingency. Who's that question yeah. for? Um, Dave. Dave. So a mortgage contingency, by the way, is a great question. So on a contract we write up for a buyer, it's going to be the day you're going to get a mortgage and the day you're going to close. The mortgage contingency basically states the timeline that the, the bank is targeting to get you a approval of a mortgage. Now, those dates on a contract are always target dates. Remember this. When you have dates on a contract, whether you're buying or selling, know that when you see that contract, those are target dates for the lender to go by. It doesn't mean it's going to happen on that day. At least 50% of the time, they need more time to get the mortgage con uh, contingency uh, on point. And the reason for that is because these banks are bottlenecked with so many loans going on that they are usually behind the eight ball. 
more important for you as a buyer, if you continue to get the lender all the documents they need every time they ask you for them, your chances of having those dates met are much, much better. So definitely know that in advance. Get documents to the lender. Your chances of closing on time and having mortgage con contingency met is going to be more likely. Oh, and one more question on mortgage contingency, actually, because sellers always ask this question, right? Is the buyer needing an extension? Do I let them have the extension? Almost always, you should let that buyer have an extension. And I say almost always, I'll say 99.9% .9 of the time, you want them to get that extension because it's something the buyer can't control. The bank needs more time to get the loan. Uh, this this question is for Eric. Um, how can you tell if, an, if a house has an arch architectural um, shingle shingle versus, versus three tab? Three tab. Joe, okay. my statement. All right. Good question, Joe. Joe needs to work on handwriting. So, um, so as asphalt roofs go, okay, as far as I'm aware, uh, there are two primary types. It's uh, asphalt shingle and three tab shingle. Three tab shingle usually has a lifespan of about 15 to 20 years. Um, architectural shingle, 30 to 35, unless it's, um, uh, there is another uh, architectural shingle that has a 50 year lifespan. Um, but it's on higher, higher end homes. Um, when you look at the roof from a distance, okay, the architectural shingle has a 3D effect to it, where it looks like the shingles are actually raised off the roof. When you're looking at a three tab shingle, it, it, it's even though there's clear uh, delineations of shingles, they're not in different levels. They're all the same level. So you wouldn't, when you're looking at it, it's flat. It, there's no 3D effect to it. That's, that's the way I can tell. One more thing about that. You mentioned the timeline, 15 to 20, 35 plus, 30 years. A lot has to do with how you maintain a roof, right? And maintaining a roof, you never want to power wash a roof. Nope. One thing we learned about the roof is if you power wash the roof, you're going to take the granules off the roof. Yeah, the and particulate. A, right? Yeah. And that roof can go from a 30-year to a 10-year like this. So very important to not power wash a roof. Second thing is with snow and ice, how to maintain that roof from not being damaged or suffer the consequences of this elements, if you will. When it comes to the snow in the roof, uh, you can have a couple options. One is you can put electric on top of the roof. They call it like a ice dam. Thank you. Some ice damming, they have like electric, you run on the edge of the roof, like about a foot off the roof that helps to heat the roof. Electrician comes in, does that. It's a great asset to a home. Second thing is when it comes to the snow in the roof, you don't have that, they use roof raking, right? Be yep. very careful when roof raking a roof, not to damage the shingle, to destroy things because you can create bigger problems. Yeah, I did the roof rake, that big storm that we had about like 10 years ago. Yes. Oh, it's not fun. Not fun. Here's one for Dave from Zoe in Madison. What season is best to sell your home? First of all, Zoe, great name. Love the name Zoe. Uh, I think it's fantastic. Anybody out there with the name Zoe? Love it. Uh, Zoe, great question from Madison and asking about, ask the question one more time so I can make sure I hear what that is in specifics. It's the best season to sell your house. Best season to sell your house. So everybody asks, when's a good time to sell my home? And I'm going to say to you that there's not a season that's not good to sell your home. Market conditions make a big difference on time of year. But specifically, every season is a good season. For example, everybody thinks and knows that the season of spring to summer is the hottest season to put your house in the market. If your house isn't a 10 out of 10 on condition and way it looks, guess what? It's going to be falling to the bottom because the competition is much higher. So then pricing your home is adjusted from there. In the fall to winter is the most serious sellers, the most serious buyers shopping. Those people are not shopping because they're just window shopping as opposed to that spring market, right? A spring market buyer might say, okay, I want to close by August. They might start shopping in February, March but they have a timeline that they can kind of go a little longer as opposed to that buyer that's shopping in the fall, winter. They're like, I need to buy a house now. I'm shopping now for a reason. Right. Well, so, good. No. No, I was going to say, um, I, I don't disagree with that, but I do have, um, so like if you're talking about a house with like an amazing backyard, a patio and ground pool, the whole nine, that's a good that's point. A difficult sell in the summer. I mean, yeah, you're going to, you're going to hope to have some pictures from the summer. You mean to give them an idea. Difficult to sell like. in the winter, you meant to say. Difficult yeah. to sell in the winter. Yes, yeah. you're right. It's a good point. So, and then conversely, if you've got a house that's um, it's wood themed on the inside with the fireplace, you know, this is all stuff that's going to appeal more for winter. You know, 
shows the warmth of the home, that, right. that the Vermont, New Hampshire type right. feel. So, I mean, there's, you know, you walk into a house Big in the winter yeah. and they're running a fire and you're smelling that, that burning wood. Yeah. It's just, it's, a, it's, it's an ambiance that you can't. Eric, yeah. that's a great point. Definitely a home with a fireplace is going to definitely appeal much more in the fall, winter for sure, because yep. it gets a chance to show its its power. As and a pot of chili on it too, it wouldn't, and, hurt, wouldn't hurt. Yeah. <laughs> for the realtors coming to show the house, of course. Yeah, um, yeah, definitely uh, agree with that. That's a good point. You make a house with a pool, beautiful landscaping, that picturesque yard. And if you know what, if you're going to sell your house in the winter or fall because you're getting your house ready, make sure to get photos done in advance so the buyers can see that. That'd be another good point to get that house ready. So when it's getting ready, say when it comes to the market in the fall, if it does have photos of that springtime, summertime look so that the buyer can at least know what they're getting into. Right. But not a family pick. Not a family. I've seen those. <laughs> yeah. I've seen With those. the family, the it, barbecue. It looks like and the jumping. ad for a pool company <laughs> yeah. or something. Really I've good. seen them. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. I like that. Oh, that's good. I've seen that too. I like yeah. it. All right. So Eric, I'm sorry, Kyle from Brantford asks, I for Eric, do you know how do you know if um, any major work has been done to a house? How do you know if any major work has been done to a house? Okay, um, so some of it will be in the disclosures. Should be, um, should be, yeah. will be. <laughs> yeah, will well, be. I, I, you know, I have I have trust in the realtors that are out there. That That's are, a good point. That yes, they're putting their stuff out. Yes, um, some of it is going to be obvious. Um, you're gonna you're gonna see um, newer you know newer cabinetry newer uh, vanities in the bathroom, newer flooring, stuff like that. I mean, some of them are going to be obvious. Obviously, you're going to you're going to leaf through the paperwork to make sure that what you're seeing on paper is what you're seeing in person. Um, and there's always the um, there's always the town hall route where you can check to see if there were any permits and stuff filed. Because if you know somebody remodels something um, or adds a bathroom. It's got to be on file with the town. Not to mention when someone does work to their house, they usually like to compliment and share that information with you. Oh, we just put a new bathroom or an addition in the house. And they usually have all the paperwork out for us. Yeah, sometimes the agent will have a sheet that lists um, all the upgrades for the last five years, two years, whatever that's been. Absolutely. Always good to show and share with any kind of new stuff you've done to your home, for sure. Yeah. Now, on the contrary, let's say something was done because they had a problem in their house. Now, sellers might be a nervous to say oh my god we had a leak in our roof right do i want the buyers to know about this i say absolutely yes number one because you have to number two it just complements the fact that hey every house has problems things happen right and as long as you get them done correctly amen let's keep going good jonathan all right now arlene from woodbridge um what does a seller pay for the pumps of a septic what do they what pay do they to pay or why do they pay why do they pay? why who are they at? is that for dave Okay. Arlene, Dave thank you for that question on the septic. All right. So if those of you who have not had septic before, a septic tank is where all the waste poop, waste goes in. Right. All the waste goes in the septic tank. And every house that has a septic tank um, needs to be based, based – it's based on the size of the house and the bedrooms that it has in it. Um, so going to your question, I'm going to kind of tiptoe before we get there. Three bedrooms, a thousand gallon minimum. Four bedrooms, twelve fifty. And then nowadays, if you're putting a septic tank, you're going most likely with fifteen hundred gallon. A tank's about five thousand dollars, give or take. And the reason why you're going to pump your tank is because that's your waste. You pump your waste. The buyer comes in. They're going to inspect that tank. They want to make sure that it's in good condition. You, as a seller, you're going to pay for that pumping out. Typical pumping about two hundred fifty bucks, three hundred bucks, right? The inspection part of the of the tank is another 250, 300 bucks. So as a seller, you definitely are responsible. And sometimes uh, we want to put that in the contract, but it's typically an automatic known plan to pump your septic tank. Seller. Seller. Yeah. Seller pumping the tank. Yes, absolutely. Yes. All right. Roger from South Windsor asks, how accurate do I need to be list, um, listing documents to buyers? Oh, it's good. Yeah, it's kind of uh, what Dave was just talking about. Um, yeah, so so when you're listing your house, okay, uh, there's uh, several documents that are on there. Um, one of the most important documents is the property condition disclosure, residential property condition disclosure. And that document, you're telling to the buyer everything you know about the house, the age of the roof, the age of the furnace or boiler, the age of the hot water heater, any known leaks, Etc. Etc. 
you want to be as accurate as possible. A, uh, you don't want something to come up in the inspection that uh, you didn't disclose um, because what's going to happen is that at some point after the inspection, the price that you had agreed to, you're probably looking at less money now because they're looking, they're looking to either get a credit or repair on something. Absolutely. So you want them to know, I mean, legally you're required to be as, as, uh, as honest as possible. Um, if you bought, and I, and I come across this all the time, you know, somebody selling their house that they bought five years ago, they don't know the age of the roof. Right. And, um, they bought the house, not knowing the age of the roof. Um, Yes, it's it's absolutely possible. Depending on what the previous circumstances were on a buy, you know, if it was a, if it was an estate or it was a foreclosure, you're not going to know the age of the roof. But they probably did a home inspection. They should have done a home inspection. If they didn't, that's poo poo on them. Because right, but even then, I mean, I can do a home inspection, and the home inspector is going to tell me I, I gauged the roof at about 15 years old. Right. Um, it's not, you know, it's not 100. Um, percent but it's, it's usually pretty good. Yeah. But I'm not going to put 15 years on the paperwork if I'm not sure. That's fair and reasonable you know, I'm for gonna sure. Put, I'm going to tell my seller to put unknown. Right. Um, and we'll write on the property disclosure that we believe it's 15 plus or 20 right. plus or whatever. Right, right, right. Definitely. But definitely, you definitely want to be as honest about it as you can. Absolutely, for sure. We have a question from Nick Hammerling. Hey, Nick. So good to see you and hear from you. Thank you for joining us today. We love you. How much is an in-ground pool to increase how much you can sell your house for? That is a great <laughs> question. You know what, Nick? That's a great question. It's been one of those questions over the past 10 years easily that we continue to get those questions. And now more than ever, actually, a pool is a significant value. But the question is it's how – dollar value. It's, well, it can be maybe more. Well, how about this? Number one, how much will the in-ground pool cost you, Right. And in the average cost of an in-ground pool is between 40 and 60 on average. Now, depending on what size of pool you have and the kind of property you have that lays out the pool, what kind of patio you put out there, it definitely adds value if it's done correctly. It looks beautiful, nice landscaping for it. The question was how much value does it add? How much value? How much can you sell your house for? How much does it increase the amount you can sell your house for? So, yeah, I guess the value uh nick it's a great question again it depends on a couple of factors um time of year would make a big difference right uh, i'll say to you the condition of the pool makes a big difference the price range your house is in makes a big difference for example if you're in a house at 250 300 350 to 400 400 that value will increase as the house value is higher for sure um that's a tough question but it's a great question what do you think Pat, well Eric? um and, I, and I'm going off of the, I'm going to play a devil's advocate and play okay. the appraiser side of it. Okay. So an appraiser, um, as I understand it, won't give the pool any value, right? Uh, yes, except this last year with the pandemic. No, no, no. We I get, definitely I get saw it. it's a different, different set of circumstances. And there was a shortage stuff, in but... heaters and pools and everything else. So right. that, so the values actually did rise tremendously. I, I mean, mean, there's definitely a value when you have folks who are looking for a house with a pool. Yes. You know, absolutely. Um, even if I listen, I've shown houses that folks weren't necessarily looking for a pool when they saw the pool. They got especially in ground. They were like, "Yeah, I could do this." Right. Yeah. And I think that the value you can set on your house is definitely going to be higher with a pool that has been maintained or newer. If you have an older pool and you haven't maintained that pool or it needs work to it, it immediately becomes a negative. Right. It just it doesn't carry the value of a remodel. Because a remodel, uh, for appraisal purposes, will take it from a C4 to a C3 or a C4 to a C2, which C stands for condition. So when the appraiser appraises the house, he, he looks at the condition. He or she looks at the condition of the house and, and makes that determination. Um, I don't know value-wise on a pool, but it, it'd be interesting. I mean, that's what we should have. We should try and get an appraiser on the show. We're definitely going to have to make that happen. I'm going to say to you on a gut check. Now, don't hold me to this, but I'm going to say 25 to 50 in value based on the value of the home first. So, for example, if you have a four-bedroom, two-and-a-half bath colonial raised ranch split-level house and you're in the ballpark of, let's say, $400,000, I think you could list your house at four twenty five, dollars maybe even four fifty. dollars it's possible. But, again, also factors include – what does your competition look like? Are those houses have pools or no? Is your kitchen and bathrooms and flooring and paint all been done? If your house is all turnkey, that pool just 
elevated the value of the house tremendously. But if your house needs a lot of work, that pool is not going to carry the value for the rest of the house. It kind of goes together hand in hand with the condition of the home. Is that fair and reasonable you'd say yeah, that? I see that. Yeah, definitely. Good question, Nick. And I love that you asked. And if you have any other questions, please reach out again. And the guys, if you're watching and listening, please continue to ask questions here. We're here live with you. We appreciate yeah. you very much. <laughs> All right. um, Jackie and Orange is thinking of selling their house. Uh, um, what are three suggestions into getting our home ready for sale for you? And that's for you, Dave. All right. So three questions in getting your house ready for sale. Uh, recommendations, yeah. right? So I'm going to say if you've been in the house 10 years or longer, for sure, I definitely recommend getting a pre-home inspection. We had the Pillar to Post company on here, and we talked about that. The pre-home inspection, number one, is going to help you and the agent identify the issues with the house prior to the house going to the market. This way we can address them, fix them up, which is going to create less drama and chaos for you when you're selling your home for sure and devaluate your house. Number two, based on the fact that the market is so hot and people are looking for certain types of elements of housing, I'll definitely say to you that painting your home is one of the best things you can do Freshen it up, go with the light grays and white trim. And I know it's a, it's a typical thing you see, but it's what the people want. So continue to follow suit with the, what the buyer's wants and needs are. Um, third thing would be, let's see, another, any suggestions at all, Eric? Uh, what were the first two? So home, oh, home inspection and painting. Paint, yeah. <sighs> For preparation of the house. Um, yeah. Tchotchkes, your favorite word. Ah, I love that. Tchotchkes. Declutter your house. <laughs> Make sure your house is getting rid of all the tchotchkes or clutter. If you have old furniture in your house, Give a ready? definition of tchotchkes. Uh, knows what a tchotchke, a tchotchke is. is the things you buy at TJ Maxx, Marshalls, and you put Marshalls? these- Marshalls? Is that like Target? It's like Target, exactly. On, you go, Marshalls. <laughs> you go and you buy these Marshalls. little items and you put them everywhere to take up space. But you clean these things up because people want to see your space. Number two, if you have furniture in your house that's older and you're going to sell your house anyway, get rid of this furniture that's old because it makes the house look worse. Or take that furniture, get some nice covers on them to make the furniture look better so the house looks better as a whole. So tchotchkes, um, for lack of a definition that they did not give, marshals and, and the like – uh, knickknacks, knickknacks, you know, little knickknacks, little statuesques, uh, little, little statues. People put these know. plates on top of cabinetry and these different planting right. and get rid of all that stuff. Yeah, it it's... just um, psychologically, uh, it makes the house look and feel cluttered, more Absolutely. cluttered than it actually is. Show your house off, Eric. It's good. I like that. Tchotchkes, right? Tchotchkes. <laughs> all right, Jonathan. Lisa and Ansonia for Eric. What are thermal pane windows? Oh, good one. Very good thermal one. pane windows. Okay, so uh, thermal pane windows. Um, so when you're going to see a house, um, uh, if the if the realtor hands you uh, an MLS sheet in the energy um, details on the house, it'll list you know smart thermostat stuff like that. And one of the things is a th uh, thermal pane windows. So thermal pane windows are either wood or vinyl. I don't know of a third uh, compound. Um, but basically it's two panes of glass. Okay. Um, and there's argon gas in the center of these two panes of glass. Okay. So what the argon gas does is it keeps the heat from outside coming in when you, when you want it cold on the inside and vice versa. So it provides a layer of energy efficiency that a regular single pane window won't. If you walk up to uh, a thermal pane window and it's cold outside, if you touch the inner glass, it should be warm or at least room not temperature cold, or something. Cold, it's right. not going to be as cold as the outer pane is and vice versa. With a single pane window, uh, unless there's a storm window on the outside, You're which is it. two layers of right. glass, but it's not the same, Right. Uh, that, that sheet of glass is going, to be, is going to be very cold to the touch. One thing I want to touch on a window is, by the way, there's a lot of window manufacturers and a lot of different elements about – we should bring a window guy. I know a guy who's a very knowledgeable guy about windows oh, – I know a guy. His name, is guy. Barry, his name is Barry Gross. He is a window expert, grew up in the business as a kid and the industry. And he basically, from scratch, building windows to selling windows to getting them out there, he works for a company called Wincore Windows. And this company makes phenomenal windows. And what I learned, I'm sorry to sidetrack you. They make the windows? They are. So they don't, he doesn't sell like Anderson. No, he actually works with Wincore. And it's been, you, there's Anderson, those different companies. These companies of windows are very expensive and they try to sell you 
and you mentioned the word argon, the different levels of argon. We're not in, our, in Antarctica. Right. You don't need windows for Antarctica. You need good windows. And based on the, how much temperature it gets down to in Connecticut and rises, that's where you want to talk to that window manufacturer or that salesperson, whoever it is. But I would definitely look into the WinCore windows as a great brand. And I'd love to have Barry on the show over here with us. I to would kind of take more about it. with you when, when some of those cold blasts come down from Canada. No offense, Canada, but keep that stuff because we don't want it. No, no. But what I'm saying to you is he, what he did is he educated me on this yeah. you know, window and – what you need really and how many temperature can drop down to you and what you need for argon levels. But, you know, I'm going to try and get him on the show. Yeah, that'd be a good one. Yeah. Right, Jonathan. Angela from East Haven. What exactly is included with the sale of the home, Dave? What's included, What's included with the, with the okay. sale of the house? So okay. when you're selling your house, yeah. uh, it's very much acceptable and expected that you have appliances, uh, a refrigerator, a stove. Some homes have dishwashers, some don't. Uh, usually they have one. Washer and dryer is something that is wanted typically by a buyer and typically left by the seller. Sometimes the seller just bought them brand new and they don't want to give their washer and dryer up. And I always say, listen, it's all negotiable washer and dryer. But if you're selling a house and you get good money for it, you know, you definitely should plan to leave that washer and dryer in the house. You are leaving your refrigerator. You just bought I had this clients I was selling and they just put a, a new brand new refrigerator. And the husband says, I'm not giving my refrigerator. I'm still paying for it. And I go, how much is your refrigerator? 2,500 bucks? I paid three. I said, listen, let's get the house sold. You're leaving your fridge. And that's just going to be it because, you know, you can't leave the refrigerator empty space. If you have empty space in a house, it's going to look funny. You know what I mean? It just right. doesn't fly. So plan to leave your appliances. Um, what else? Appliances. Um, some. Uh, so you'll often find uh, the Nest the Nest thermostat will be left behind. They actually can't take those off the walls um, because it's attached. Right. Um, sometimes they leave the rings. You have to leave the ring. I just you learned have you have to leave the ring. You cannot be – anything that's attached to your home, you cannot take with you. As a matter of fact, the newest thing I found out is you know those window those, – I'm sorry, the brackets that hold the TVs? You can't yeah, take – the mounts. You can't take them out off the wall. Huh. You cannot take anything that's attached to your house – when selling your house off the property, unless you disclose in advance that you're taking it. You're taking it. And then you have to repair that area perfectly and use the cost of repairing that location can be a challenge, but that's yeah. another. And, and some of the stuff that gets left behind that you may not want. Is right. Too. Yeah. Like um, workbenches, you know, workbenches or cabinets that were installed in a basement or in a garage. And yep. You're like, I don't want this stuff. And the, right. buyer, and the seller says, well, I'm not taking it out. You have a, you can have, you a, have a boom, boom, boom. Right. Yeah. It could be, it could be, but typically if it's attached already and the buyer and the seller haven't negotiated that specific, like an older cabinet, a lot of times you're right in basements, they have the older cabinets down there. Yep. Most of the time people or the garage space. They're like, it's a good thing. It's not a bad thing, but if you don't want it, you have to tell as a buyer to that seller, hey, listen, I don't want these in the house. I want them removed. No, I've seen I've seen basements and or garages that have like these little house on the prairie type cabinets <laughs> up that you know the you know my buyers are like, yeah, we don't want those. Right. You know. But if they tell the seller in advance, let them, you know, that makes it much easier. Probably yeah, the point. seller's like, oh, it's that. You know. It's all that, right. That's yeah. why you hire good realtors to negotiate those kind of things. All right. We have just about time for one more question. So let's actually wow, to we're Nick. flying through. Nick again. Let's go to Nick again. I love it, Nick. Thank you so much reaching out over here, buddy. Sure, uh, sure it's not the same finished, question, right, Jonathan? You know, okay. If you have a finished basement with a half bath, would, you, would spending money to turn it into an in-law setup be worth the money to do a resale or just leave the finished basement? So is the half bath there or not there yet? It's, yeah, it's already there. It's there. Okay. If the half there. bath is there, is it worth converting into an in-law? Well, it's twofold. I'll let you address address the the monetary value side of it. Um, the 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 aspect that I'll address is of the let's say let's use a round figure and let's say there's a hundred folks that are going to look at your house, okay, or, or that gonna, that are going to have interest in your house based on the town, the number of bedrooms, all of that stuff. How many of those folks want an in law? Okay, so there may only be ten who are. Um, interested in having an in-law. Uh, the other 90 don't want an in-law, don't want a second kitchen, don't want to have to deal with a second kitchen. 
So um, I would I would take that into account when I'm deter making the determination on whether or not I want to put an in-law in my basement or if I want to turn my basement into an in-law because it's like, okay, are there people that, I mean, is there more value in it? And that's where I would ask you, is there more value in the in the in-law? So here's what I'll say to you on the in-law. I'm going to say, yes, there's more value for two reasons. Number one, if you have a family with older kids, an in-law is fantastic. It gives another space for the older kids to go to you, to be there, that they can have their own personal space. A full bathroom always adds more value to your house over a half bath, if you will, because it's not a place you can shower, of course. And then depending where the in-law is, is it something where the in-law is in the basement or is it at the back of the house? An in-law can be in more than one type of location. It could be a place that even maybe potentially could earn you some income if there's an, an egress in it. What's it called? Uh, you can get in and out of the house. Like I just got lost towards uh, to use that. Mm -hmm. What it's called. But uh, my point is that definitely for rental purposes, for, could, for rental or you could have technically people renting from you or living with you. But I definitely think a full bath is going to add 100% more value. I think the idea of an in-law is great because they don't have a lot of in-laws out there. And it's very common in towns that if someone is looking for an in-law, typically it's a town where, again, larger families are moving to for lots of reasons. It could be education reasons, school, uh, a lot of commuting reasons. So an in-law is definitely going to add value and it makes your house one step above the others and more unique in value. Yeah. Definitely more valuable. All right. That was our last question for the night. So you know what that means. Hold on. Dave didn't plug the. Uh... All right. So Heather. Heather has been wonderful in making these beautiful tumblers. And every week, as you know, we do a giveaway. And by becoming a person who is following us on the different elements of social media we have, each time you go onto a different social media out that we use and you become a follower or a friend of ours, you're automatically going to be. One more time, having your name in the drawing on the wheel of spin, the spinning wheel of excitement. Uh, and as a first, it's a spinning wheel excitement. of death. Yeah. The, the spinning wheel of excitement and, uh, and gifts <laughs> and gifts from us. Uh, so let's go quickly and let's see who we got for a winner today. Maybe Nick wins because he deserves it. Nice, nice job, Melody. Congratulations on winning the Tumblr. We're very excited for you. I just want to talk quickly about this upcoming month before we go. We've got a lot of exciting new things coming up as guests over here. Uh, we're going to end the month for sure uh, with something that is going to be Halloween oriented. Um, you mean next month? Well, is it not well, October? It is Today's, it's the last Tuesday of the month. You know what? Okay. We're the last Tuesday of the month. Next month, my apologies. I think we're in October already. But uh, we are going to have some Halloween uh, exciting guests to talk about some haunting of houses and people who are maybe hunting ghosts. And does it <laughs> change the value of your property? That might be another question in mm -hmm. it. Uh, another one, Eric, by the way, which I'm going to bring on is – we're great, great idea there, Jonathan. Uh, I'm going to bring on the wife of a realtor on the show who is going to talk about – her experience about being a wife of a realtor, uh, that what it's like to be a, have that in your life. Because I know that there's a lot of spouses out there who have a realtor as a spouse and what it means and what their life is like and how their relationship is. And I think that'd be kind of exciting show to put her on the spot. Okay. Or the husband of a female realtor, right? Or the husband of a female yeah, realtor. Okay. I was actually, it's a little, it's a little I was actually speaking specifically about Valerie. Oh, okay. <laughs> so okay. I'm going to bring, I'm, I'm going to bring Valerie in the show this upcoming month. I think she'll be fun to deal and to talk with over here. Uh, I don't know what she's going to say. Hopefully Jonathan has the ability to filter, filter. <laughs> yes. <laughs> beep, 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 beep. <laughs> I don't really have a 10 second delay. I don't think we can record that yet. So I think that'll be fun. Uh, and there's some other guests. We're going to actually, you know, by the way, I was talking to Ian from Vanguard. Yes. Uh, cigar club and maybe next week we're gonna go check out his place and do our podcast there on tuesday nice. i think there'll be a lot of fun i think that uh haven't getting had back, a cigar since he was here haven't had cigars since you know what actually i did have when i was in florida but i'd like to get back to see ian at the vanguard uh vanguard cigar club also if you are a business and you would like to get spotlighted we'd love to bring you here spotlight your business let everybody know what you do how great you are and what you bring to the community and help your business out Dave here and Eric, Team Powerhouse, Cobalt Banker. We're excited to have you every week with us. 
our team agents will like to get on the show here hopefully as well. We have uh, some exciting new things for them to share uh, as well from the team. We have a new agent joining our team that I'm going to keep hush hush till it comes out and everybody knows what's going on. And uh, anyway, really happy to have you here today with us. And I guess that's it for Tuesday. Yep. Thank you all for joining. Thank you for joining us. We'll see you next week. Have a great day.